you going to be doing another Spider-Man movie? Those are so wildly popular. Do you think you're going to make another one? We are planning to make another Spider-Man movie next year, starting in February or March. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What if Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 actually happened? This is Fanscription. This is one of those what-ifs I've been thinking about tackling since we first started this show over three years ago. It's a fascinating subject that has had fans wondering what could have happened for over a decade. And with the release of Spider-Man No Way Home, interest in the past movies of the character have hit a fever pitch. Since Spider-Man 4 was abruptly cancelled in 2010, we've learned quite a bit about what Sam Raimi and his crew were working on. Storyboards and early animatic of the climax and video game footage from both the Wii and Xbox 360 have all come out recently describing little details of what was planned. From these materials we can surmise several story beats. In an opening montage, a few well-known villains were going to make cameos. This intro would end with Spidey bringing in Mysterio, who was going to be revealed as none other than Bruce Campbell. The story was going to feature the Vulture as the main villain, with Black Cat possibly stepping in as his daughter with her own mechanized Vulture suit. Sony was reportedly pushing to include the Lizard, too. Those rumors were likely true, since we saw the transformed Kurt Connors appear in the rebooted Amazing Spider-Man. Ben Kingsley and more prominently John Malkovich were eyed to play the Vulture with Anne Hathaway on the short list to play Felicia Hardy. Most of the original cast was set to return, including Kirsten Dunst, J.K. Simmons, Rosemary Harris, and Tobey Maguire himself. Raimi has openly talked about how much he disliked Spider-Man 3 and was hoping to redeem the franchise with a fourth installment. If it succeeded, Sony was planning two more films following this one. Unfortunately, the director wasn't able to put together a story he liked enough in time to make the studio's May 2011 release date. He didn't want to compromise on Spider-Man 4, and was dead set on making it the best installment yet. I'm sure Sony once again pressing him to include characters and story elements he didn't agree with were also major factors in his decision to leave the project. He gave studio head Amy Pascal his blessing to proceed with their reboot, which was already being planned anyway, and with that, Spider-Man 4 died to make room for a new continuity in 2012's The Amazing Spider-Man. For our fanscription version of the story, I want to keep the basics of what was being constructed, the Vulture as the main villain being the most important detail. I'll put my own spin on certain things, but I think there could have been some great stuff with that character as we saw in 2017's Spider-Man Homecoming. This will also be a sequel to my What If Venom Wasn't In Spider-Man 3 episode. Check that video out if you want all the details, but I did come up with some major changes. The most significant one being the death of Mary Jane at the hands of a corrupted Harry Osborn. Osborn also died during his misguided attack as the successor to the Green Goblin, in addition to claiming the life of Captain George Stacy. I introduced his grieving daughter Gwen at the very end of the revamped outline. So Peter is at a very low place here. He's come off of some of the most traumatic events in his life and is stubbornly moving forward with the help of Aunt May and a new circle of friends. With that recap out of the way, let's swing in on what Peter's been up to and answer the question, what if Spider-Man 4 happened? That iconic, familiar Danny Elfman Spider-Man theme gets us back in the mood for another adventure. The opening credits show the events of our version of the last film, ending with Harry and MJ's deaths. We quick cut to a montage of Spider-Man individually, bringing in a recognizable parade of bad guys. This includes the Rhino, Shocker, Prowler, and more, but ends with Mysterio. Just as in the storyboards for the proposed film, the helmet is removed to reveal a frustrated Bruce Campbell. Don't you ever get tired of this, you eight-legged freak? I'll never get tired of seeing that fishbowl get popped off your head, Beck. Take care, Officer Davis. See ya, Spidey. Spider-Man thwips out of the police station. It's not a fishbowl. It's a sonar-activated, hermetically sealed, one-way plexiglass dome with a holographic projector. And it helps maintain the illusion! All right, all right. Move it, Mr. Mystery. Mysterio! Yeah, whatever. From there, we see Spider-Man swing through the city. His once vibrant costume is now worn down and faded. A few sewn-in patches are even visible as his signature narration plays. 
Yep, it's still me, good old Peter Parker. I've gotten pretty good at this Spider-Man thing over the last few years. A couple of threats here and there, but nothing like the old days. I've still got Aunt May to keep my head out of the clouds. Jonah drags me back down to Earth on a regular basis, too. But the staff job at the Bugle pays the bills. I started working with Dr. Connors on my graduate thesis last week, so that's finally happening. Six years is a long time, but I can still see your smile. Still hear your voice, just like it was yesterday. Not a day goes by that I don't think about you. How I let you slip away. I've made it my mission since to never let that happen to anyone ever again. So far, so good. Love you, MJ. I'll write again soon. We see Peter writing in a journal that he updates a couple times a year. A picture of Mary Jane is on the cover. He puts it away inside his dresser drawer and leaves his new condo for another day of work. With this story taking place six years after part three, there are many things that have changed about where Peter is in his life. He works with Kurt Connors as a graduate assistant, where he sees Gwen Stacy almost every day. They've become close friends over the years. The trauma of what they both lost on that fateful night long ago brought them together, and they have a strong platonic bond. They see each other as colleagues and equals, respecting the other's intelligence. Yet, there is a playful rivalry between them. As mentioned in the opening narration, Peter dove headfirst into his role as Spider-Man after MJ's death. It's almost become an obsession. There were points over the last few years where he stayed in the costume for days or even weeks at a time. He also refuses help when he's under the mask, only friendly with a couple police officers he knows by name. Parker is confident in his experience as New York's hero and outwardly still the quipping, charismatic Spider-Man he was before. But he's very closed off. Peter doesn't want to get too close to anyone or put those he does care about in danger. This has led him to lead a somewhat isolated life. That evening, we see a young couple out for a romantic stroll in Central Park. The timid nature of their interaction indicates it's their first date, and they finally reach a point where they have some privacy. The setting sun provides the perfect backdrop for a shy first kiss, but as they both lean in, the woman notices something strange, silhouetted in the multicolored twilight sky. What the hell is that? Oh, sorry, I thought we were, uh... Look! The man turns around. But before he can get a good glance, huge talons aggressively grab his shoulders and lift him off screen. The woman screams in horror as her date is carried off into the distance. In a wide shot, he struggles to release himself from the human-sized bird creature, dragging him away into the ever-darkening ether. We cut to the Daily Bugle. Peter looks troubled as he peers at a newspaper headline that reads, Terror in the Sky, Mysterious Bird Creature Abducts Another. Parker! Peter snaps out of it and walks into J. Jonah Jameson's office. Parker, where were you all day? I was at ESU, like I am every Wednesday. How long have you been in school anyway, kid? What is this, your fourth degree? Actually, it's my- Don't care! Got an assignment for you. Arthur Avis, new rich guy in town, setting up shop. He's got a press conference at the Continental tonight about a research grant. We need pictures! That might be a conflict of interest, sir. I'm working with Dr. Connors and- Conflict of interest? The only conflict here is my interest in this conversation. It's at eight. Now get out of here! Fine. By the way, I wasn't paid last week. Miss Brandt, Cut Parker is checking. Tell him to stop dressing like a high schooler in the 60s. Peter rolls his eyes and leaves the office. Robbie then walks in and solemnly sits in Peter's place. You're going to have to tell him sooner or later, Jonah. Jameson drops eye contact and doesn't respond. As Spider-Man, Peter takes a shortcut by web-swinging over to the hotel where the press conference is at. On his way, his spider sense goes off. He stops on the side of a building to look around, but nothing seems amiss. Ah, <sighs> I need a vacation. He swings off. A moment later, we hear a stealthy mechanized noise and see the back of a woman's head appear in the frame. Her white hair flows in the foreground as Peter web slings away in the background. Peter walks into the press conference. A figure behind a podium speaks, with reporters and photographers in the audience facing him. Behind the presenter, a slideshow is being projected onto a large screen. The portrait of an elderly man is the current visual. Our founder, the late great Adrian Toomes, once said that knowledge means nothing if it's not shared with our fellow man. With this research and development grant to Empire State University, we hope to pass on this knowledge not just to our children, but their children, and so on. Of course, getting us to this next level would be no easy task. That's why I'm proud to bring on board our lead geneticist, Dr. Miles Warren. 
and with the help of ESU's own distinguished Dr. Kurt Connors, a new field has been created to label a new era in the scientific community, neogenics. And with its studies, will not only heal our sick, but eradicate this planet's worst diseases, all before the end of this century. Think of it, a world where time is not our enemy, where time is our closest friend, giving us the freedom to finish our life's work, the freedom to spend more of that time with the ones we love. That's our founder's final gift to us all. Don't waste it, because as he would say, the sky's the limit. The gathered crowd of press executives and scientists applaud. The speaker is Arthur Avis, CEO of AT Enterprises. I'd have him played by Killian Murphy. Keep in mind, this movie was supposed to come out in May of 2011, so these are the 2010 versions of any actors we use. Avis is handsome, confident, charismatic, and a bit mysterious. As a former pilot in the Air Force, Adrian Toomes built his organization as an aerodynamics company, specializing in anti-gravity technology. But shortly before his death, he brought on Avis and Dr. Warren to start shifting focus to cutting-edge genetics research. This has all led to the corporation recently moving to New York for higher profile opportunities. In the crowd, Peter takes a few pictures and looks on suspiciously as Dr. Connors, who's more of a geneticist now for the purposes of this story, gets up on stage with Gwen Stacy. Connors and Avis shake hands and raise each other's arms into the air victoriously, the audience still cheering them on. Moments later, Peter walks up to Dr. Connors and Gwen, who are sharing drinks with Avis and Dr. Warren, played here by David Tennant. Peter, let me introduce you to Arthur Avis and Dr. Miles Warren. This is Peter Parker, one of my prize students. Number two ain't bad, right, Pete? Gwen playfully teases her friend. Parker responds with a sarcastic grin. I've heard a lot about you, Peter. It's too bad you can't join us in the labs this time around. I was hoping you'd apply for the assistantship. Yeah, I gotta stick to finishing up my graduate track and paying the bills for now. I'm a photographer at the Daily Bugle. Really? I thought the camera was just an accessory. The group chuckles. Gwen said nothing but brilliant things about you. Peter shakes Avis's hand and his spider sense kicks in at a very low degree. Thinking it's just malfunctioning like earlier, he ignores it and looks to Gwen with his eyebrows raised, pretending to be surprised by the compliment. Well, after I already got the assistant job, I thought I didn't have much to lose. I'd love to hear more about your background, Miss Stacy. We'll have to do dinner sometime. Gwen looks pleasantly surprised and stumbles over her words a bit. Oh, ab- absolutely, Mr. Avis. Avis turns on the charm. Please, call me Arthur. Peter awkwardly stands by as his colleague is hit on by her new boss. You all can call me Arthur. <laughs> Parker, why don't you get a picture of the Knights of the Round Table here, before we're off to save the world? Hmm? Oh, sure. Smile. They all pose. Avis makes sure to put his arm around Gwen. Peter is a bit weirded out as the photograph is snapped. The camera flash transitions us to the next day, where we follow Peter roll up on his moped to Aunt May's apartment building. He enters the unit to see May on the floor struggling to get up. Aunt May! He helps her up to a nearby couch. She's a bit out of breath, but seems to be okay. Thank you, Peter. I'm fine. Took a little spill, that's all. I wish you would just move into the condo downtown. I could keep an eye on you more often. No, no, this old lady isn't going to burden you any more than she already has. You'll find out eventually. This is all a part of the program. When you get to be my age, you slow down. Can't go backwards now, can we? They go on to talk a bit about the anniversary of MJ's death and Aunt May's advice on moving on since she's been through it with Uncle Ben. She then delicately brings up the possibility of moving into a nursing home. I'm not putting you in one of those places, Aunt May. If you would just let me take care of you. Peter, you're a young man living your own life. I'll slow you down. And you have certain... responsibilities I know you can't always get out of. I wouldn't want to beat it over the audience's head, but I'd imply that May knows Peter is Spider-Man. And he knows she knows. However, they never talk about it. Sort of an unspoken pact between the aunt and nephew. The conversation ends with May once again encouraging Peter to take advantage of his time as a young man while he can because one day he'll wake up suddenly 50 years older, wondering where the time went. 
Peter goes out web swinging to clear his head that night. With MJ's anniversary, Aunt May's age visibly starting to catch up with her, and a strange feeling he has about the AT Enterprises situation, he has a lot on his mind. His quiet meditation above the streets of New York is violently interrupted by his spider sense going berserk. But before he can react, he's attacked by a blur flying at him from out of nowhere. Peter pushes the assailant off and can see it's the bird creature from earlier in the film. An ear-piercing shriek rings through the air as the creature ominously circles its way back around like a vulture. That's when we first get a clear look at it. A human-sized suit, mechanized but intimidating, expands its large, dark green metallic wings. The rest of the suit is black and dark brown with steel talons in place of feet. The face of the creature is covered by a black helmet that comes to a small point at the nose and mouth. Two emotionless circles emit blood-red light from its eyes. It flies with great speed back at Spider-Man, who is able to avoid most of the contact this time. However, a part of the razor-sharp wings slice open his suit close to his ribcage. Peter yells in pain. He recovers enough to hit the creature with a few impact webbings, but they're almost instantly shredded by the edged pinions. Spidey is able to jump on its back and holds on for dear life. The creature pulls a maneuver that flips Spider-Man forward onto a nearby rooftop as its talons land on his shoulders, cracking the concrete below. Peter is hurt and can't move. The creature's wings fold behind its body as glowing red eyes lean in close to Spidey. Before the creature can deliver another blow, it's abruptly hit in the side of the head by a small explosive. It falls to the ground next to Spider-Man, who looks up to see a woman appear out of thin air. She's wearing a form-fitting black tactical suit adorned with weapons. Her hair is pale white and her face is partially covered by a black mask and goggles. This is the debut of Black Cat, portrayed here by Betty Gilpin. She would have been in her mid-twenties at the time of shooting, and we know from GLOW she can handle the physical aspect of the role. She wasn't a well-known actor at that point, so we're going to say this would be her hypothetical breakout performance. The vulture slowly rises with its helmet badly damaged, as sparks pour out of a crack in it. Injured but visibly angry, it shrieks again, forcing Black Cat to cover her ears. It takes that opportunity to fly away and fight again in the future. Spider-Man is pretty banged up, but hobbles to his feet to see that the mystery woman is gone. Exhausted and confused, he stands alone on the rooftop. All right, next time, I'm walking home. We cut to the brand new AT Enterprises building, where on the inside, we follow Dr. Warren walk up to Arthur Avis's large office. He knocks on the door, but there's no response. After a moment, we hear someone inside project a blood-curdling scream. Warren is affected by the noise, but tries to keep a straight face. The mechanized door opens to reveal Avis in workout clothes, wiping the sweat off the back of his neck. He's a bit out of breath, but nonchalant. What is it, Miles? I, uh, have the new performance reports for you, sir. And? The cell transformations aren't showing any signs of lasting longer, but Connors has a few theories. We should have some improvement by next week. Do you trust his assessment? I trust him. He's a good man. Don't get so comfortable with the help, Doctor. We need ESU for the laboratories and Connors' expertise. We're not here to make friends. I can say the same thing about you. Warren struck a nerve. Avis turns around like a predator approaching his prey. What? I'm just saying, there's nothing wrong with getting to know the people who are helping us achieve the impossible. If you listen to me about what else the serum is capable of- I'm only interested in one thing, Warren. Avis stands uncomfortably close to the doctor. Don't forget your place. The higher you go, the thinner the air gets. So keep your eyes to the ground. Because if you fail me, Doctor, you can join another partner of mine who couldn't stand the altitude. Intimidated, Warren leaves. The next day, Peter is feeling the effects of the Vulture's attack, but still attends his weekly graduate assistant side job at ESU. He enters the classroom just as a few students are filing in and meets with Gwen and Connors. Hey, Peter. He's noticeably in pain. You okay? Yeah. Uh, just sore from working out. Gwen's obviously not buying it. Right. How's the AT project going? They're a demanding organization, I'll say that. But Dr. Warren knows his stuff. 
We're trying to modify a compound that he's been working on. I suggested some adjustments that might help, but their timetable is a little quick. Which is why we're leaving the classroom to you today. Gwen and I have to head down to the labs to get back at it. The lesson plan's all set for you. Eva sounds like a demanding guy. Aww. Are you mad we're spending more time with him than you lately? You don't find him a little too... bold? There's nothing wrong with being bold, Parker, but I'll let you know after our date on Saturday. Gwen and Connors go to leave, but the doctor is held back by Peter's concerned stare into space. He's still favoring the cut on his side as well. Peter, are you alright? Really? Do you trust Davis? He hasn't given me a reason not to. There's something off about him. I just can't put my finger on it. He just wants results, that's all. I get the feeling that's not the only thing bothering you. Get some rest tonight, okay? I know you've got a lot going on. He pats Peter's shoulder and leaves. Peter grimaces from the pain again and is left at the head of the lecture hall. I definitely want to build that mentor relationship these two have. Connors cares for Peter like a family member. They've been friends a long time now and try to look out for each other. That evening, Peter searches the web for information on Arthur Avis, but can't find anything before a few years ago. This further provokes his curiosity, so Peter digs deeper. He looks into public records about the mysterious CEO, scrubbing through every file he can find, but fails to discover any history of Arthur Avis prior to him being hired at AT Enterprises. At a dead end, Peter starts researching the recent abductions to look for patterns in the victims. There don't seem to be any. However, in Seattle, similar stories about a bird creature abducting people were reported on conspiracy theory sites spanning the last decade. A certain number of people did go missing, but no one took the creature story seriously. They were considered a local legend akin to the Mothman or the Jersey Devil. This particular myth was nicknamed the Vulture. Peter's expression then changes, as if he just remembered something. He looks back into Adrian Toombs' company and sees that they were originally based out of Seattle before recently moving to New York. Peter absorbs the information and becomes even more suspicious. We hard cut to the same shot the next morning. Peter fell asleep in front of his laptop. He slowly wakes up and looks at his watch to see he's hours late for work. Peter rushes to clumsily gather his things before dashing out the door. When he finally arrives at the bugle, everyone seems a bit down in the dumps. Betty Brandt calls for Peter and solemnly motions for him to enter Jonah's office. He can sense something is wrong as he apprehensively walks inside and closes the door. JJJ is sitting with his back to the entrance, his eyes fixed outside his window. Sit down, Parker. Sorry I'm late, I was- You're fired. Peter is stunned. Wh what Why? Jameson turns around. He's uncharacteristically grim. This isn't the first time you've been late, kid, but there's more to it, you Mr. see. Mr. Jameson, I need this job. I can't afford my condo or my aunt's apartment without it. Can you just get me through the next semester? I know he said he wouldn't do it anymore, but I can get you more pictures of Spider-Man. The has been bought out. It's not my call, and your bug friend is old news. He doesn't sell papers anymore. I can give you a small severance package, but that's it. Half the staff is out by next week. The new owners are pushing us to go digital. Makes me sick. My hands are tied. Jameson puts his cigar in his mouth and goes back to staring out his window. Peter slowly accepts the news and walks out to the bullpen, where Robbie and Betty are there to greet him. The old man's pretty broken up. Despite how he acts, he fought hard to keep you on. There's just no way to compete anymore with the staff this big. I'm sorry, Peter. Betty hugs Parker as Robbie rubs his shoulder. Hey, you're about to have a couple college degrees. Soon enough, you can finally get a job in your field. You'll land on your feet. You always do. Yeah. As he walks out, Peter's phone rings. He answers. Hello? His face drops. Peter bursts through the doors of a hospital and up to the front desk. I'm looking for May Parker. Cut to a few minutes later. Parker is anxiously waiting in the lobby. He's approached by a doctor who tells him May took a tumble while out getting some groceries and broke some bones. She'll be confined to a wheelchair for the next few months, but she should recover eventually. Peter enters May's room. She's in decent spirits, but angry with herself for worrying her nephew. I'm sorry, Peter. No, no. Aunt May, don't apologize. I should have been there. No one can be everywhere. Not even you. Peter looks drained. Well, you'll be seeing a lot more of me, because I got fired today. That old crow fired you. Yeah, it wasn't Jameson's fault. They had to release half the staff. Just bad luck, I guess. Don't worry, I'll figure it out. I always figure it out. 
You don't have to do everything on your own, you know. There are still people out there who love you, Peter. The friends you have are good ones. You're a natural helper, but don't forget that once in a while, it's okay to lean on them for a change. Peter seems a bit too exhausted to accept any advice and sort of brushes off his aunt's notion. While in Queens that night, we see Peter pacing down a sidewalk, obviously in his own head. He visits his old neighborhood in Forest Hills and discovers that it's seen better days. A few of the buildings sit condemned. He stops across from his old house. Memories flood back to Parker when he gazes at Mary Jane's childhood home next door. The street is nearly empty as he stands alone, lost in thought. After a reflective few seconds, he notices a light flash inside one of the nearby houses. We cut to inside the house, where three burglars in ski masks raid the home of its valuables. One is holding a flashlight as they're trying to be quick about it. You guys picked the wrong neighborhood. The flashlight moves to illuminate Spider-Man, hanging upside down right next to them. The burglars freak out and try to book it for the door, but Spidey webs up two of them at the ankle. The third pulls out a gun and fires several shots. Spider-Man dodges them, but screams are heard behind him. He checks a closet to see the family who lives there tied up and gagged. Spidey leans in to help them. Outside, the third burglar quickly enters his car and peels out. He has a good head start, but Spidey catches up to him, landing on the hood. The vehicle is now speeding down a busier road as bystanders are put in harm's way. Spider-Man is flung off the car by a sharp turn. He shoots out a web and it connects with the bumper and he's dragged from behind, scraping against the street. After two police cars are seen close by, gaining on the thief, Spider-Man is able to stand up and skid across the asphalt like a water skier. Residents and motorists look on at the precarious scene as they zoom by. Just when the wall crawler is about to make his move, another car is shown screeching from the driver hitting the brakes. But it's too late. The car slams into Spider-Man from the side and sends him into a pile of garbage on the curb. The burglar races off with the police closing in on him. Spidey lays weary and buried in garbage. Yeah, they got it. Some people stop and take pictures of Spider-Man in this humiliating situation. Rough night. On top of a local building, the black cat character crouches, looking down on the fallen hero. You again? Who are you? Follow me and find out. If you can keep up. More people start taking out their cell phones and start recording Spider-Man. Quickly, he jumps away and follows the figure in black. Spidey has a tough time catching up with her as they travel deeper into the city. She effortlessly swings through the air on grappling hooks while showcasing agility well above normal human limits. Finally, he chases her to a rooftop, but when he lands there, she's nowhere to be found. Right here, Spider. Spider-Man turns around to see Black Cat again appear out of nowhere. This time, she's hanging upside down, close to his face. Spidey takes a step back as she lands perfectly in front of him. All right, ladies, spill it. Who are you? And what's your connection to the Vulture? I see someone's been doing his research. You want my name? Show me yours. I'll show you mine. I don't have time for games. Well, Spider-Man, if we insist on using our stage names, just call me Black Cat. Very original. I knew you'd like it. I've been following your career for a long time. You could call me a fan. Here's my number. She tosses him a miniaturized communicator. I work alone. Considering the stench of moldy banana on you, maybe it's time to change that. Our flying scavenger friend has become a mutual problem. No kidding. I've been tracking him for years, picking my spot. I think with your help, we can finally take him down. I told you, I don't need help. Now what's your connection? He killed my father. I'm... I'm sorry. Keep the sympathy, Spider. As Black Cat explains, we see flashbacks in Shadow play out. My father used to work with him. He was his business partner, actually. Until the bird decided he didn't want a partner anymore. He made Dad's death look like an accident. No one believed me, but I know what really happened. He saw what they were doing behind closed doors. Real sick stuff would make a snake's skin crawl. Dad spoke up, threatened to go to the police, so they killed him for it. Vulture absorbed his stock in their company and went on to become a multi-millionaire. 
But before he died, my father was working on a specialized military suit that augmented strength and speed, agility, not to mention full stealth. Vulture has an earlier version of it, without some of the bells and whistles. Of course, he added his own poultry fetish with the wings and a few other things. But dear old dad kept a new prototype at home, which you're feasting your eyes on at this very moment. Impressive. Why did he attack me the other night? You're why he's in New York. He wants a piece of what you got under that suit. Can't say I blame him. Who is he? Black Cat smiles. You sure you want to know? Elsewhere in the city the following evening, doors open to reveal a dapper-looking Arthur Avis. He enters a crowded, high-class restaurant and spots Gwen Stacy in a stunning black dress sitting alone at one of the tables. She looks a bit nervous and out of place. Avis walks up behind her without Gwen noticing. He puts his hand on her shoulders and leans in to speak in her ear. You look amazing. Arthur! He takes the seat across from her as waiters fill their glasses with water and hand them menus. They're written in French. Um, I don't speak French. Arthur smiles and looks to the waiter. He effortlessly orders for the both of them in the language. The waiter takes their menus and walks off. You're just full of surprises, aren't you? You don't know the half of it. I have to admit, I'm not used to places like this. Oh, this one's my favorite in the whole city. So far, anyway. Gwen looks around at the expensive decor. It's beautiful. You fit right in. Gwen blushes. So, how do you like working with Dr. Warren? He and Connor seem to be getting along quite nicely. He's brilliant. A bit absent-minded sometimes. <laughs> Reminds me of Peter in that way. Parker? She nods. You two are close then? We've been through a lot together. Did you both ever... Gwen looks surprised by the implication. Oh, me and Peter? No, <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. He's just a, he's just a very good friend. <laughs> it's good to know. He's lucky to have someone like you around. What about you? Any ex-wives I should know about? <laughs> no, no time. You've been around as long as I have. You start to put things into perspective. What's most important is my work. But if someone ever came along with the same goals, had a remarkable mind and a smile as bright as yours, maybe then I'd consider stopping to smell the roses. Gwen is flattered, and the two share a short romantic stare. But Gwen's expression quickly turns to sympathy. You have an old soul, Arthur. It sounds like a lonely existence. But it is an existence. Arthur's smile drops a bit. The look of a survivor bubbles to the surface as the background music at the restaurant changes to Swan Lake. Gwen notices this change in Avis's demeanor. She then looks down to see his right hand trembling on the table. Arthur, your hand. Avis quickly pulls the shaking appendage toward his body, hiding it from Gwen. It seems to be marked with liver spots. He starts sweating and visibly quivers. Are you okay? Uh, I'll be right back. He abruptly leaves the table, bumping into a waiter on his way to the bathroom. Arthur! Inside the bathroom, Avis locks the door behind him. He looks in the mirror to see swaths of gray hair appearing. Bags also begin to show up under his eyes, as he seems to be aging rapidly. He aggressively makes his way out of the restaurant, but takes one last look at Gwen, who sits looking off the other way, obviously worried. A moment of longing in Avis's eyes is interrupted by someone cutting in front of him. He then forces himself to leave. Covering his face with his jacket collar, he stumbles outside into the pouring rain and climbs inside the limo he arrived in. It speeds off. We then see Gwen one more time, alone and concerned, inside the restaurant. Inside the AT Enterprises building, yelling and loud crashes are heard inside Arthur's office. It sounds like he's tearing up the room in a rage. A few of the security guards have called Dr. Warren up to check on the boss. He tells them to leave, and he slowly enters. The room is half in shadow, the other half lit by lightning strikes outside. A dark figure in the shape of the vulture stands breathing heavily. Adrian? The voice that responds is guttural and filled with contempt. You. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Look at me! He's
steps forward as lightning illuminates Avis' features. He's aged at least half a century into the face of AT Enterprise's founder, Adrian Toomes. This older version of the character is played by Max von Sydow. Toomes stands in the vulture suit, perhaps about to go out to capture another victim. The effects are barely lasting a day now. I was in public warn! We can fix it. We'll come up with something until you bring Spider-Man in. I still believe he has the potential to make the transformation permanent. We're on the verge of a major breakthrough here, Adrian. But you have to trust me. What makes you think the bug's blood will even work? That's just another theory. We came all this way for one of your theories! You can't even develop a method to stave this off, working with one of the most brilliant minds in the world! We need closer genetic matches for enduring results, you know that! We're working around the clock, Adrian. I just need a little more time. Rage slowly fills Adrian's face. He violently grabs Warren and bursts out of the large window. Tombs fly straight up into the air, going higher and higher until they're well above the city. Rain, thunder, and lightning surround them as Warren screams in fear. Adrian! No! Please! What's wrong, Doctor? Air too thin? Can't stand the altitude? Stop! I beg you, Tombs, listen to me! Tombs holds Warren in his claws by the sides of his shoulders. The ends of those claws then stab into Warren. The doctor wails an inhuman howl as fluid starts to flow from his body into tubes built inside the vulture suit and vice versa. Vials around Adrian's neck fill with that fluid as Warren himself begins to rapidly age. The fluid then shoots straight into Tombs' veins and he growls with pain and pleasure. He throws his head back and we see his face get younger and younger until it once again looks like Arthur Avis. He looks into the eyes of the now decrepit Dr. Warren and smiles. Goodbye, Miles. He drops the doctor from his grasp, and he falls thousands of feet to the city below. A lightning strike captures the moment like the flash of a camera. Toombs looks down with a sinister smile as Warren plummets to his death. Peter shows up at ESU the next day to find police officers talking to Gwen in their lecture hall. She's clearly upset. What's going on? She walks away from the officers to break the news to him. They've arrested Dr. Connors. For what? Gwen takes a breath after glancing behind at the police. Dr. Warren was murdered last night. Peter's baffled. One of the attending officers walks up to him, seeking to ask some questions. Peter's face changes from concern to anger. We cut to an interrogation room, with Dr. Connors sitting under a harsh light. His hands are cuffed to the table. A detective opens the door, and in walks Arthur Avis. Connors is surprised. I asked for my lawyer. What is this, Avis? Arthur silently gestures to the detective, who leaves them alone and locks the door from the outside. The detective stands guard against it, which confuses an onlooking officer, Davis, who we saw at the beginning of the film. Hello, Dr. Connors. I didn't kill Warren. I know. Connors is angry and confused. Then why the hell am I in here? because I paid off the officers to arrest you. Just like I paid off the forensics team to plant DNA evidence at the scene. And the detective's here not to record this conversation. Connors takes a moment to digest the answer. What do you want from me? What I've always wanted from you. Your expertise. The truth is, that neogenic serum you were working on with Warren, I have a personal investment in it. Keeps me vital. Seum's worked for a long while, but its effects are waning. Miles couldn't crack the code, but you, you are on the right track. I need you to fix my problem, Dr. Connors. Work with me exclusively, and all of this will go away, like it never happened. Refuse, and that brilliant mind of yours will be wasted scratching equations onto a cell wall for the rest of your life. Connors struggles to take all this in. He also notices Avis' hand quivering. You have 24 hours to decide. Make the right choice. Avis gets up and pounds on the door. If not for me, then for your wife and son. The door opens and Avis exits, leaving Connors in a quiet panic. We cut to the outside of the police station from a high angle. Avis leaves and gets into his limo. As it drives off, we see Peter in the Spidey suit intently watching on top of an adjacent building. 
His expression filled with fury, he pulls down the mask and stealthily tails the vehicle for miles. This eventually brings him to the old warehouse district. Curiously, Avis is dropped off at an abandoned looking storage building. He looks haggard and moves slowly. His limousine drives away while he steps inside the dilapidated structure all alone. With no one else around, Spidey covertly makes his way inside. The dark warehouse looks empty. Not a soul can be seen. Peter's confused but alert as the power is abruptly turned on. A makeshift laboratory is revealed, all lit in green. A vulture suit sits empty behind glass, along with several human test subjects being kept alive and sedated in water tanks. Spider-Man can see that they're severely aged. <laughs> After all the trouble I went through hunting you down, the spider crawls into my nest like a moth to the flame. That's funny, because the way I see it, the only one who's about to get burned is you. I know who you are, Tombs. The vulture's helmet mechanically pulls back, revealing an elderly Adrian Tombs. Do you? So much anger, so much power. I look forward to feasting on your carcass, boy. Vulture remotely activates a defense system that begins firing at Spider-Man. He's able to dodge a few bullets and disable the system, but Vulture takes the opportunity to capture the advantage. Thanks to Dr. Warren, Toombs knows all of Spidey's signature moves and eventually pins him down with his talons, then lifts him with his claws. Even spider strength is no match for the Vulture's suit. This time, there's no escape. Finally, and now we put the theory to the test. As he did with Warren, Vulture begins siphoning Spider-Man's youth. Parker screams in agony as Toombs transforms again into his younger self. But before Vulture is fully finished, Spidey is able to shoot a few webs up into his face from underneath. Vulture staggers back. When he's able to rip them off, Spider-Man is gone. The helmet encloses on his face and he shrieks loudly. With no trace of him in the lair, Vulture quickly goes to look for Spider-Man outside. We see Spidey huddle in the shadows, hiding. Vulture is unable to locate him and flies off to search elsewhere, the warehouse locking behind him. This leaves Spider-Man, moving noticeably slower, to barely make a getaway. Spidey haphazardly swings deeper into a local neighborhood and eventually falls to the ground hard. Peter groans on the empty street, feeling depleted and lethargic. He unmasks in a nearby reflective window and sees that he's easily 40 to 50 years older. This older Peter is played by original Spider-Man TV actor Nicholas Hammond. Hammond would have been in his early 60s in 2010, but I'd add some subtle age makeup to have him look at least 10 years older. Peter is shocked, but he knows he has to get out of sight. He lurches forward, getting weaker with every step until he collapses in front of a house. A woman inside sees the old man on the sidewalk and rushes out to him. She yells for her husband to call an ambulance as the camera closes in on Peter's aged, unconscious face until the image goes out of focus. We dissolve to Avis's office inside AT Enterprises. Frustrated that he wasn't able to locate and finish off Spider-Man, he searches through Warren's notes on his computer. He's trying to access the doctor's files on Spider-Man and how his biology will react when combined with the neogenic serum. However, Toombs finds he's locked out of all the folders. Not even the CEO's credentials can get through to them. In frustration, he pounds the keyboard and it shatters through to his large office desk, splitting it in two pieces. Toombs is surprised by this added strength, but smiles with satisfaction. A strange sensation then hits him as he moves lightning quick to grab a fly out of midair. Toombs is confused by this rush of adrenaline, but we know he's also absorbed Peter's spider sense. The next day, Peter slowly wakes up in a hospital room. He can hear the nurses outside talking among themselves about how some crazy old man in a Spider-Man outfit was brought in last night. He was in bad shape, but seems stable now. Using his guile, Peter is able to sneak out of his room with the Spider-Man suit they left in there with him. In the room over, he steals another sleeping patient's clothes that have been left out. Parker tries to act natural as he looks to find the exit. He passes an open room, then double takes to see Aunt May asleep inside. As fate would have it, he's been brought to her same hospital. Peter stares sympathetically for a moment, and remembers her words about leaning on his friends. He may have dismissed his aunt's advice before, but it resonates now. 
A nurse then touches him on the shoulder. Excuse me, where is your visitor's pass? Peter is caught, so he uses his newfound old age to his advantage. Dang thing must have fallen off. Are you family? Yeah, I, I, I'm her brother. Older brother. The nurse looks a bit suspicious, but walks away as Peter gets one last look at his aunt. Cut to Connors, still remanded in a prison cell. Shadows of the bars shade his face as he stares off quietly. After a moment, we start to hear a struggle in the background. Connor stands up concerned while violent impacts are heard off screen. But just as suddenly as they began, they stop. A new shadow blocks out the light on the doctor. It's in the shape of a woman. Black Cat shuffles through a set of keys, unlocking the cell door. Connors looks confused. What's up, Doc? Soon after, we're in Black Cat's hideout, which just so happens to be a high-rise penthouse that the owner of is out of town. She drops down onto the balcony with Connors hanging off her shoulders. They walk inside to see Gwen standing around nervously. Dr. Connors? Gwen. What's going on? Whoever this is won't answer any questions. Hi, guys. Spider-Man gingerly steps forward. We need to talk. Spider-Man? Peter unmasks, showing off his aged face. Kind of. It's me. Peter. Parker. He looks down ashamed, but eventually finds the courage to lift his head. I need your help. The following montage has all four characters plan out how they're going to take down the Vulture. After Gwen and Connors are filled in on who the Vulture and Avis really are, they work on a serum that reverse engineers the original Neogenics formula, with the aim of restoring Peter's youth. It's also mentioned that Vulture could have absorbed some of Spider-Man's powers, to which Peter offers an idea to potentially counter that problem. Black Cat gives Spider-Man a new suit based on her own technology. She says it should be a match for Vulture's powerful exoskeleton. I have a suit. Time for an upgrade. You can thank me later. I'm sure you got all the measurements right. Well, I did say I was a big fan. Cat also fills Peter in on the Vulture suit weaknesses. Parker has finally been forced to let his guard down and trust those around him. He knows it's a risk, but to stop Vulture, it's one worth taking. Later on, Peter stands out on the balcony. He looks on at the city as the sun sets behind it. Gwen then joins him, holding an injector device. Are you ready? I can't exactly run away, can I? She flashes an amused smile. Are you sure this is going to work? No, but the doc is confident. It should neutralize the serum in your system and reverse the aging process. We also left a defensive component in there if Vulture tries again, so don't worry. 65% survival rate. She goes to inject his forearm. Gwen, wait. She stops. I'm sorry I never told you I was Spider-Man. Well, it does explain a few things. I should have been honest with you a long time ago. The night your father died, I... That wasn't your fault. I know you, so I know you did everything you could to stop what happened. But I wasn't the only one who lost something that night. We can't move forward without looking forward. You have to forgive yourself, Peter. They sympathetically stare at each other for a moment before Peter responds. Thank you. Ow! Gwen has injected Peter with the anti-serum. You're welcome. Slowly, Peter reverts to his more youthful state. He touches his face. Did it work? That night, a rejuvenated Arthur Avis is about to hold a press conference on the roof of the new AT Enterprises building. Police and press are in attendance. Thank you all for joining me here today. The shocking death of our lead geneticist, Dr. Miles Warren, has shaken AT Enterprises to its very core and the foundation of our neogenics program is also at risk because of the unconscionable actions of one Kurt Connors, a man I trusted, a man Miles Warren trusted, and a man whose recent breakout from prison casts a shadow of fear over all of us. But I'm here to tell you, our work will continue. Make no mistake, he will not escape justice. I've been working closely with the police, and they will be given full access to any resources we can provide. But as our company in the city of New York looks ahead, I can promise you that Neogenics and all the hope it brings to a sick and dying world will not be halted. Because, as our founder, Adrian Toomes, famously said, the human spirit must soar. 
For once you've tasted flight, you will never walk the earth the same again. There you've been, and there you'll always long to return. Above the horizon. Thank you. Nice speech, Adrian. The speakers are taken over by a woman's voice. No one seems to know where it's coming from. Is that what you told Walter Hardy before you murdered him in cold blood? What about all the other victims you've abducted and killed over the years? Ladies and gentlemen, Arthur Avis doesn't exist. He's a facade, a glossy mask hiding something much darker. The man you applaud is not just a murderer. He's a monster. It's true. Spider-Man lands on the roof in the new suit Black Cat gave him. Avis is surprised to see him looking so spry. Don't listen to this nonsense. He's been out to get me since I arrived in New York. Not all of us have something to hide, Spider-Man. This fraud framed a good man. Kurt Connors didn't kill Miles Warren. He did. The crowd doesn't know how to respond. I know I'm not the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man I used to be, but I'm asking you all to do something I'm not always capable of myself. Trust me, please. Most of New York has grown to trust Spider-Man over the years. He rarely speaks publicly, but when he does, the citizens usually have his back. You mess with Spidey, you mess with New York! You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us! You wanna get to him, you gotta go through me. And me. Me too. They start to question Avis. It's not true. It's a lie! Spidey makes a cue to start playing something over the audio speakers. Because I paid off the officers to arrest you. Just like I paid off the forensics team to plant DNA evidence at the scene. And the detectives here not to record this conversation. Thanks to Officer Davis for his due diligence. Looks like you paid off the wrong people, Toombs. The crowd completely turns on Avis. He starts backing away as the police approach him. Fine. He hits a button on his watch. Avis runs off the stage and dives off the roof to the shock and horror of those gathered. After a moment, a deafening shriek is heard, and he rises as the vulture. Panic ensues. Black Cat deactivates her stealth mode and appears on the roof. She attacks Vulture while Spider-Man tries to clear the bystanders out of harm's way. Vulture attempts to distract his opponents by grabbing and throwing a few people off the building but Spider-Man is able to handle it. That's when Vulture's new Spider-Sense comes into play. This advantage gets one over on Black Cat as she struggles to land a blow on Tombs. After she's thrown off into a building, Spider-Man joins the fray, trading punches with the flyer. After landing a few shots, Spidey seemingly flees, swinging off further into the city. Vulture pursues him, but Spider-Man is just out of reach. It's obvious the web-slinger is leading the villain somewhere. Eventually, Spidey thwips a web onto one of the Vulture's talons and is dragged through the air. Spider-Man slowly climbs his way up to the Vulture and hops on his back, influencing the direction of where Tombs is flying. However, they both start to lose control and nosedive toward a baseball stadium. They crash with impressive force into the middle of an empty city field in Queens. Vulture is the first one limping to his feet. His helmet has cracked and fallen off, revealing a bloodied face. He steps toward Peter, but before he grabs him, Toom suddenly stops in his tracks and snaps out his left arm. He seems to be holding something, but it's not visible until Black Cat is revealed through her cloaking device failing. Vulture's stolen spider sense is working flawlessly. Who are you? A defiant look crosses her face, but she has a tough time speaking through Vulture's grip on her throat. <laughs> Felicia Hardy. Hardy? <laughs> you Walter's daughter. It all makes sense now. Your suit. A prototype, I'm guessing. Walter always was good at keeping secrets. Tell him Adrian says hello. He tightens his grip on her neck when Spider-Man shouts from the ground. Now! Out of the new suit, a helmet forms over his head. We see Dr. Connors with headphones on somewhere in the stadium. He turns a knob on a switchboard. A screeching frequency blasts out of a few of the stadium's speakers. It activates Vulture's stolen spider sense, and he turns toward the noise, looking for a threat. We then see Gwen in a separate location turn a similar knob. The same frequency is blasted out of the other side of the arena, and Vulture flies toward it, but there's nothing there. 
Gwen and Connor switch more knobs. Now all the speakers in the stadium are blasting out different levels of that frequency. Vulture is becoming overwhelmed. He crouches from the sensory overload. You like the new suit? It comes with a few accessories. He knocks on his helmet, which is protecting his own spider sense from being affected. It's over, Tombs. In a last-ditch effort, Vulture grabs Spider-Man and flies through the side of the stadium to escape the crippling vibrations. We see Gwen react. Peter! Outside the stadium, Peter's new helmet has come apart as he lays on the concrete in pain. Filled with rage, Tombs bursts out of the rubble and violently lifts Spider-Man into the air. He then rips off his mask. Parker! You little fool! I don't know how you reversed the effects of the serum, but this time I'll take double your power and turn you into a crumbling pile of bones! He begins the same process that turned Peter into an old man. The serum pumps through the tubes in the vulture suit and into Peter. Parker screams as the fluid flows back into tombs, but something's wrong. Peter starts to age for a moment, but then goes back almost instantly. The young false face of Arthur Avis begins to age into the elderly Adrian Tombs. When he notices this, Vulture drops Peter and staggers back. He screams in anguish as we see him continue to age until his skin withers away to the bone. His body drops to the ground motionless. Peter steps over to see that the suit is now empty, minus some ash blowing in the wind. The defensive component that Connors and Gwen put into Peter through the anti-serum worked to an unpredictable degree. We dissolve to some time later. Black Cat stands on a building looking at a news report on one of the big screens downtown. It mentions that the late Arthur Avis was both Adrian Toomes and the Vulture. Evidence suggests he was behind the recent abductions, the death of Miles Warren, and the murder of his old partner at HT Aerodynamics, Walter Hardy. Spider-Man lands next to Felicia. I'm glad you finally got some justice for your father. Not justice. Revenge. Well, we can debate that later. How about some pizza tonight with Gwen and Connors? I'm buying. Black Cat smiles. I don't think so, Spider. Felicia, you can call me Peter. He starts to take off his mask. Keep it on. The mask is rolled up to his nose. I'm leaving. Why? I've been on the move my whole life. Couldn't stop now if I wanted to. Besides, I'm wanted in every state from here to Ohio. Wait, what? But I'll be back when you least expect it. See you around, Spider. Her stealth function kicks in, and she disappears. Peter steps forward to stop her, but she's already gone. Disappointed, he goes to pull down his mask, but he's stopped by an unseen force. Black Cat becomes visible one more time. She's hanging upside down and passionately kisses Peter. Before their lips even break apart, she disappeared for the final time. Peter is stunned by the tender smooch, but gathers himself and pulls down his mask as he looks out over the city. We see Peter join Gwen and Connors outside of ESU. They all embrace. I owe you both so much. You saved me. After getting me out of prison and clearing my name, I'd say we're even. Spider-Man is a hero, but you're the man behind the mask, Parker. Your secret's safe with me back to work. See you two later. Connors walks off, leaving Gwen and Peter. Thank you for believing in me. Of course. I mean, it only makes sense that you'd ask for help from the top student at ESU. <laughs> Number two ain't bad. They both laugh. Gwen looks like she's about to say something else when police cars whiz by blaring their sirens. Peter looks concerned before peering back to Gwen. Well, at least you know where I'm sneaking off to now. Have fun. Peter takes off to confront this unseen threat as Spider-Man. As he runs off, Gwen lingers. She stares in his direction with an ambiguous smile. Spider-Man swings through the city following the police cars as his narration kicks in. Trusting people has been hard since you've been gone, but that's starting to change. There are still people there for me when I need them. We dissolve to Peter helping Aunt May into a nursing home and getting her settled in. They both look happy to be in each other's presence. As I get older, I've found that it's important not to focus too much on what's been left behind. J. Jonah Jameson steps out of the Daily Bugle and looks back at the building with a sad but signature stern face. We see a for rent sign get put up in the front window. He exhales and walks off into the crowded New York streets. We have to look forward to move forward. 
But that doesn't mean I'll ever stop thinking about you, about our time together. For the rest of my life, I'll never stop loving you. Until next time, yours, Peter Parker, Spider-Man. Spidey swings toward the camera. The credits kick in, and the movie ends. In a post credit scene, we see a man from behind looking around the interior of a familiar apartment. The door to the room is clumsily opened as Ursula and Sergei Dikovich walk in. So, what do you think? Just to let you know, the first month's rent needs to be paid ahead of time. Give me rent? The man turns around and is revealed as a healthy, untouched Miles Warren. He smiles mischievously. I'll take it. And that'll do it for another friendly neighborhood edition of Fanscription. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, I wanted to keep some of the elements from the bits we know of Sam Raimi's original story, but put my own twist on them while adding different ideas. Some of them can set up future sequels, as was going to be the case if this did well back in 2011. I tried to put a different spin on the Vulture and alter him into a more Dracula type, hungering for youth instead of blood. Black Cat's inclusion changes her backstory from the comics, but I thought tying her into the Vulture character somehow worked well enough here. Peter continued to limp forward after the death of MJ, but learned how to trust people again by the end. He had to fully rely on Black Cat, Gwen, and Connors to take down the city's latest threat when he realized he was completely outmatched. Now, if this were an actual movie, there'd definitely be a few more scenes to fill in some of the blanks, but hopefully you got the gist of the full story. I'd love to do another one of these at some point, so let me know what you thought of my version of Spider-Man 4 in the comments below. If you liked the episode, share it out with your friends and family who might enjoy it. Also, how would you have written this script? Did you even want another Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie? Tell me! As always, don't forget to check out our Fanscription podcast where you can listen to audio versions of all our episodes. We'll be on a reduced schedule for 2022, so don't expect as many episodes next year, but you can stay on the lookout for a few big ones coming up soon. See you then, webheads! <laughs>